Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'da habita fillah Continue on in our study Of kitab fil iman By imam Abi Ubaid Al Qasim ibn Salam Al Harawi Rahimahullah ta'ala Who died in 224 Hijri So it's very important to get a glimpse of this great Imam and his position or his level that was acknowledged by the ulama of Ahl Sunnah as far as his level in ilm, his level in ilm of fiqh and understanding the religion and preserving the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being from amongst the salaf of this ummah. So Abu Ubaid Al Qasim ibn Salam, Rahmatullahi Lay, Rahmatin Wasia. He is Abu Ubaid Al Qasim ibn Salam Al Baghdadi, the Imam, the Mujtahid, the Ocean of Knowledge, the Linguist, and the, ling uh, the Legal Jurist. He was born in Hera, Hera in about the year 158 Hijri. And his father was a Roman slave to some of the people of Hera. So Imam uh, Abu Ubaid was not uh, an Arab, as we see. And it shows us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used many of the non-Arabs to preserve his religion, like Imam Bukhari and Muslim with Tirmidhi, wa Kathir, Kathir min al-Muhaddithin, that they were not uh, Abu Dawood, they were not uh, Arabs. And they came from around the world and their people embraced Islam and they became some of the great preservers of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Abu Ubaid was from amongst those, uh, those great men. And with that being said, it also is described in some of the texts that he had red hair and a red beard as part of the description of what he looked like. He heard or learnt from a group of the trustworthy Imams like Sufyan ibn Ayyana, Ismail ibn Uliya or Uliya, Yazid ibn Harun, Yahya ibn Sa'id al Qahtan, Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, Hamad Ibn Salama and others. Imam Ad-Darami Abu Bakr ibn Abi Dunya, Ali ibn Abdulaziz al baghawi Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Marwazi, and others narrate from him. Imam Ishaq ibn Rahwaya said, Allah loves the truth. Abu Ubaid is more knowledgeable and has deeper understanding than me. So this shows how the Salaf uh, revered this man for his, for him being one of the Ansar Sunnah, those helpers and supporters of the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. And it shows us as the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam uh, which mentions the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا تزال طائفة من أمتي ظاهرين على الحق لا يضرهم من خالفهم ولا من خذلهم حتى تقوم الساعة. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, as related in Bukhari and Muslim, that there won't cease to be a group from my nation on the truth. No one will harm them who differs with them or goes against them until the hour is established. Letting us know that Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'a and those who traverse the Salafi Minhaj from the Salaf al Salih to those who follow them in righteousness until the day of judgment are were present and will remain present. And that's why the Prophet والسلام, said, La tazal ta'ifatun min ummati. There won't cease to be a group from my nation. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to be from amongst them. And in order to be from amongst them, that means you have to have the sifat of Ahl Sunnah. 
that you make ta'adheem of the book of Allah, of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in accordance with the salaf of this ummah and that you take it as complete, as a complete way of life and as a complete deen that you do not try to compromise it by adding to the religion what is not from re the religion or belittling what is from the religion what should be exalted from the religion and upheld from the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that means you are not extreme. La ifrat wa la tafrit. That you are not uh, wasting the pr principles as some of the some of them say uh, today, mumayya, that you are belittling the principles of Ahl Sunnah, throwing them away. For example, not refuting Ahl Bid'ah, never. Never speaking about Ahl Bid'ah, who challenged the deen, who challenged the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. By leaving off those ahkam ashar, especially if you have the ability and if it is a duty upon you as a caller to Islam to establish the haq and refute the batin, that this is from the characteristics of Ahl Sunnah is that they practice and implement that duty of righteousness. Whereas Ahl Bidah or those who are weak in their application of the sunnah also fail to do this duty and at the same time it also means that the person is not a person of ghulu, of extremism where they go beyond the sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this is also madhmoon this is also sinful this is also against the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that for example a person implements the, uh, like the takfiris make takfir, they make tabdi in the same way. Some people are so shadeed, and shadeed means not that they're shadeed in holding onto the sunnah, they're shadeed in going beyond the sunnah, because ghulu is to jawz al-had. Ghulu, or extremism, is to go beyond the hadud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that from the sunnah, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the rud and refute ahl bid'ah, and from the way of the salaf, the minhaj of the salaf. But the person who ref refutes and goes against Ahlul Sunnah and attacks Ahlul Sunnah and follows up the mistakes of Ahlul Sunnah, then these are the persons of Ghulu. These are the persons who go beyond the HUD. They go beyond the duties that are required of them to where they become sinful, wicked, uh, and sometimes Mubtadiyah, sometimes innovators in the religion of, of, of Allah. Because how is it that you could refute and spend your time attacking? the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those people who adhere to the book of Allah, the sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the men as of the salaf of salih, and call the people to it, and implement it in their lives, and then you have the nerve to go and attack and belittle them. So those aren't the sifat of Ahl sunnati wal jama'ah. And Ahl sunnati wal jama'ah, they hold on, they, they, as we mentioned, they exalt tawheed as well. The Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Tawheed al rububiyyah Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, Tawheed al-Asma'i wa Sifat. And they exalt the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his actions, his statements, his characteristics, and those things he accepted sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they practice and implement Iman. And they believe that Iman is made up of actions, statements of the tongue, and belief in the heart, or actions of the heart. That all of this is Iman, and that's the Moldur. That's the concept or the subject that we're dealing with in this book, Kitab Fil Iman, by Imam Abi Ubaid Al Qasim ibn Salam, Rahmatullah alayhi rahmatin wasiya. And so it was said also about Imam. Abu Ubaid, that Imam Ishaq al Rahwaya said, and he also said, We are dependent upon Abu Ubaid. And Abu Ubaid is not dependent upon us. Showing that he had makana, that he had ilm, and he had fiqh, that the great Aimma, the Aimma to Sunnah, those preservers of hadith, that they looked to him. They said, We are dependent upon Abu Ubaid. 
and Abu Ubaid is not dependent upon us. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Rahmatullah alayhi wa rahmatin wasiya, Rahimahumullah jami'an and all the a'imah to sunnah. He said, Abu Ubaid is a teacher, and every day he increases in good. This is a, a tizkiyah from Imam Ahmed. Imam Ahmed sunnati wal jama'ah. And Yahya ibn Ma'in was asked about him, to which he replied that people should ask Abu Ubaid about him. And this is an important faida here, Habitafillah, is that sometimes we find the people ask people who are less in stature about mountains of knowledge. And one of the examples recently, because of some fitna that became uh, between some of the scholars of Ahl Sunnah, and the people began to ask a scholar who is who has knowledge, no doubt, a great scholar. But they asked him about an, an imam, imam of the sunnah in this time, who teaches in the haram, imam, Salih Sahimi, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, one of our great scholars, Walillah Alham, that we had a chance to sit with, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve our Shaykh, Amin. And as a aside, those who live in the UK, please, whenever he comes back to the UK, because he seems he's come going often, at least annually, if not a couple times a year, do not hesitate. I don't care if you live in Birmingham, and I don't care if you live in Croydon, I don't care if you live in Brixton, I don't care if you live in Hull, England, that you make a rehba, you make a journey to sit with that imam while he's still alive and still has nashat and is still propagating the sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Abu Dawood said, that he was trustworthy and reliable. Al Hafid ibn uh, Al Hafid al Dhahabi, Imam al Dhahabi, Rahmatullah said, Whosoever looks into the books of Abu Ubaid will know his high rank in memorization and knowledge. He was a Hafid of Hadith and its defects, knowledgeable of fiqh and the difference of opinions, a pillar in the language, an Imam in recitation, and he had books concerning them. I have come across his books. Kitab al-Amwal and Kitab al-Nasikh al-Mansukh. Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi said he was possessing nobility, religion, excellent manners, a good madhab, an excellent book sought after in every land. And the narrators from him are famous and trustworthy, deserving mention and excellence. And his book concerning al-Amwal is one of the best books Written in fiqh. And despite these virtues and excellent qualities, the six imams of the famous six books in hadith did not report any of his hadith. And this is from the many evidences that they reported from only some of the trustworthy narrators of hadith. So there is nothing strange after knowing this that Imam al Bukhari did not narrate, it, narrate from some of the trustworthy narrators from the Ahl al Bayt. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them all. And may Allah have mercy upon Imam al Bukhari. From the words of Abu Ubaid, are the follower of the Sunnah is like one holding on to hot stones. And in this day he is more excellent in my eyes than the one who raises the sword in the way of Allah. So it shows how Imam Abu Ubaid and the Salaf Umumin, how high in status they held the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how important to them ilm was and talib al ilm and how magnificent it was in their eyes for one to be from ahlu sunnati wal jama'ah especially on the ilm of fiqh that the imams they they loved this and they knew how important because those are the defenders and preservers of the religion who spread the religion based on ilm of fiqh and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man Allahu bihi khayran din. Whenever Allah wants good for a person, He gives him understanding of the religion. So, Ahl Sunnah loves those people 
who called to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the minhaj of the Salaf al Salih, even if they have mistakes, they don't follow them in their mistakes, but they are not the people who belittle the Ahimma or the Mashaykh or less than them, the Du'at or less than them, the Imams of the Masajid or anyone who is a caller to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on the book and the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they understand the Salaf al-Salih. This was in his time. So what about our time? About the importance of those people holding on to the sunnah, that it was like hot coals. Look how much, look at the shubahat and the shahwat that we face in this day and age. We have so much, it's unbelievable the challenges we have through social media and the internet alone of ways to destroy your religion. Either through reading doubtful literature, and I know many people. One example, uh, there's a person here in Saudi Arabia, and I won't name his name. He apostated, and he lives in a small city here. And I recall that this was a man, we always tried to encourage him to seek knowledge. You need to better and improve yourself. But he never left the house to seek knowledge. Instead, he just stayed, stayed with his family. And there's nothing wrong with giving family family time, but also give time to your soul. Have some soul food. And soul food is al. And there was Mashaikh there in this mantaka, this small place. But he, instead, eventually, after years and years, he I think he's still there, living there. But he openly apostated. He became, I believe, a Christian. After probably leaving Christianity, coming back full circle, only because he read and got in the shubahat on the internet. Another individual, and I will name him, Morton Storm, who was a, became a CIA operative, became a work for M, uh, M15 or whatever, the MI5, the ones in the UK, the intelligence services in, in, in the Danish intelligence services, and was a major tekfiri at one point, but he started out with us. I met him when he was a new Muslim. Sheikh Mukbil used to mention him and love him. He used, I used to go with him to see Sheikh Mukbil. Sheikh Mukbil loved him. He was new, he was eager. But he didn't really seek knowledge. He didn't get grounded. And so like a ping pong ball, he went to Minhaj to Minhaj. He started out with the Salafis and, and the environment was too much for him, I'm sure. And then he got with the Ikhwanis in Yemen. Later he progressed to the Tekfiris and he became very extreme with all having and became uh, uh, high in status in being with those Tekfiri groups and became an enemy of Ahl Sunnah. And what is his end result? He left Islam. He cursed Allah, he cursed the Deen of Islam, and he left it and apostated. And that comes, Ahabatifillah, from not being grounded and not holding on to those coals, not holding on to those hot stones, and staying on the minhaj of the salaf. So Imam Abu Ubaid, Rahmatullah alayhi, Rahmatul Wasiyah, he stayed in Baghdad for a time. Then he became the Qadi in Turtus, so he became the, the judge there. Then after that, he moved to Mecca and he lived there until he died in the year 224 Hijriya, as we mentioned. Indeed, the Imam began his treaties by saying, Rahmatullah alayhi wa rahmatullah qal, Indeed, have you asked me about faith? and the difference of the nation concerning its completion and its increasing and decreasing. And you mentioned that you would like to know the position of Ahl Sunnah with regards to this and the proof of those who differ from them on this. So indeed, may Allah have mercy upon you. Know that this subject was discussed by the Salaf at the beginning of this Ummah and by those that followed them, meaning the Tabi'een, and those who followed them till this day of ours. 
I have written to you a short explanation of what I know concerning this. So here in Imam Abu Ubaid, Rahmatullah Rahmatan Wasiya, he began his treatise by making dua for those who would read it. As he said, may Allah have mercy upon you. And many of the people, or in fact, we can say that this was the way of the Salaf, that you'll find in many of their books, and you'll find that in the later scholars of Ahl Sunnah as well, that they would supplicate for the listeners or those who were reading their text in order, and this was a way, of course, of softening the hearts and opening the hearts and the mind up to the knowledge that was going to be imparted. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon us all. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. And this is a way of softening and establishing that connection between the one that you're studying with and the one and yourself or the listener and the one who is teaching. And so this is a beautiful sunnah that we should never leave and we should strive to, uh, to implement in our teachings. So Imam Abu Ubaid, he mentioned a very important point that Iman, it increases and decreases. So Ahl Sunnah believes, and he said that this is the belief of Ahl Sunnah with Jama'ah, that Iman, it fluctuates. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. And people to follow it in their Iman, as we've said countless times, that there are some uh, people who have a very high level of Iman on a regular basis. And then there's others who are lowered because of their sins and the things that they involve themselves with. And also there's a relationship, of course, with, with ilm and amal. And as we've said, as, which was a statement uh, uh, imparted by our, our noble Salaf, that al-amal thamarat al-ilm, that actions or deeds are the fruits of knowledge. So knowledge is not just memorizing and reading books, but knowledge is implementing those things that you read and those things that you memorize and practicing it. it should, there should be some thamarat, there should be some fruits of your seeking knowledge, that you should have better manners, that you should interact with people better, that you should not be a corrupt individual, that you should not be an individual who curses and spies and kills and harms other people, but rather you should have the fruits of good deeds. You should be more tamasik, bi kitab wa sunnah. You should be more adherent to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam and everything that Islam calls to. Then he said, no, may Allah have mercy upon you. That the people of knowledge and concern for the religion have split into two groups over this issue. So here, uh, Abu, uh, Imam Abu Ubaid is distinguishing the fact that the that Ahl Sunnah has a view and the Murjia, Ahl Bida, has a view. And as we spoke about in our last lesson, we talked about some of the various sects like the Jahamiya, the Mu'tazila, Kulabiya, and the Asha'ira, and how they differ with Ahl Sunnah with regards to some of the, uh, their beliefs as far as Al Asma'i wa Sifat, the divine names and characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and regarding the Qadr, and we talked about Iman, that those groups all, or most of those groups, have the, have uh, some irja in their belief, except for perhaps the Ma'tazila. And the other groups, they all have some variation of irja. And irja meaning that deeds are outside of Iman, that deeds are not a part of Iman. And there's various variations of that belief. And we talked about some of it in our last sitting. So then Abu Ubaid, <coughs> Abu Ubaid, Rahmatullah Ali, Rahmatullah Wasi, he says, and one of them says, meaning one of the groups, faith is sincerity in the heart to Allah and testimony of the tongue and action of the limbs. The other says, rather faith is in the heart and upon the tongue. As for actions, then they are from taqwa, they're from God-fearfulness, and bitter 
and piety and are not included in faith. So now right there we already have the categorization that Imam Abu Ubaid was talking about. The first belief is the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The second belief is the belief of the vi various beliefs of the murjia, of the groups that have some irja with its various manifestations in belief. And as he said, that they believe that they make a separation. So they believe that faith is in the heart and upon the tongue. And we see that that effect, that that affects many of us in this day and age where many of the people say, you know, you don't know what's in my heart, brother. And that's true. We don't know what's in your heart. But Ahlus Sunnah, Ahl Sunnah, they judge by what is apparent. And your outward appearance as well as your is is a revelation of what's inside that doesn't mean it's absolute it doesn't mean someone who looks good on the outside that for example if he's a man and he's got a beautiful big beard and his thobe is short and this and that and the other that he's necessarily a righteous person he could be a monafic he could be the most evil of people but this is just uh a general illustration of what's in the heart because all of it makes up Iman. And we've mentioned some of the proofs with regards to that. And one of the proofs from the hadith of Abi Sa'id al Khudri radiallahu ta'ala who called Samaitu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a yakul Min ra'a min kum munkhanin fal yagayruhu bi yad fin lam yistati' fa bi lisanahi fa in lam yistati' fa bi qalbihi wa dhalika adu fil Iman. Ruahu Muslim. In the hadith in Sahih Muslim, the hadith of Ali Sa'id al Khudri, radiallahu ta'ala, and who said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, uh, Whoever sees a munkar, then change it with his hand. If he's unable to do so, then, then change it with his tongue, meaning speak out against it. And if he's unable to do that, then change it with his heart, meaning to hate it with his heart. And that's the weakest form of. Iman. So the Prophet ﷺ, what's the delil? What's the evidence that, how, what's the istidlal? How do we use this hadith? I, I want you to ponder this. How do we use this hadith in this issue? The answer is that the Prophet ﷺ said in the last part of hadith, وَذَلِكَ عَدْعَفُ man. He said, and that is the weakest form of faith, letting us know that all of it falls under the musamma, faith. All of it falls under faith. It all fun, falls under faith. So that is evidence, and that's how we make istilal, as we talked about in some other sittings, making use of the evidence, because evidence is one thing. Ahl bidda uses evidence. How can anyone say anything in Islam? and not have some evidence for what they say. The Asha'ir have evidence, Kulabiyah had evidence, the Ma'tazila had evidence, Jahamiya had evidence. The groups today, the Takfiris have evidence. The many Sufi groups, they have evidence. Most, for many things they say, not everything, but some, some of the things they say, of course, or no one would listen to, no one would respect that and be deceived by that. But it's the istilal. It's how they use the evidence. Is that evidence in accordance with the understanding, the correct understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. What, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant, for example, uh, in, in, in his divine speech in the Quran. Or is that what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meant in authentic hadith? And is that in accordance with how the Salaf al-Saleh, how they understood those issues? So that is how we look at the, the we see the istilal how they seek to use something as evidence. And the other group, as we mentioned, is the Murjia. And then Imam Abu Ubaid, he said, and we looked into the difference of opinion of these two groups, and we found that the book and the Sunnah affirmed the truth of the group that made faith intention, saying, and action together, and negated the opinion of the other group, meaning the Murjia. And the basis of this, which is our proof, is following what the Quran has spoken of, for indeed Allah has said in the unequivocal, unequivocal, uh, unequivocal verse of his book, so if you differ amongst yourself on anything, then refer it back to Allah and the Messenger. If you believe in Allah in the last day, that is better and more suitable for the final determination. And could, and, uh,
So here, Abu Ubaid, so to, to get us a further, a further understanding of the context here, that Abu Ubaid is talking about here, and this is showing a, a variation, he's talking about the Murjia, uh, the, uh, the Murjia Fukaha, the groups, the group of Fukaha. That means these were people of knowledge. These are people who were respected by Ahl Sunnah. But they fell, they went astray in this issue of Iman. They made a mistake. That's why he said it with respect. Notice how he respectfully talked about the Murjit, Murjit of Fukaha. He said, Know, and may Allah have mercy upon you, that the people of knowledge and concern for the religion have split into two groups over this issue. He didn't say Ahl Sunnah and Ahl Bid'ah have two views, but here he's talking about them because they, in general, had the belief in Ittiqad and everything of Ahl Sunnah. But in the issue of Iman, they made a mistake with their understanding. And it led to their irja of believing that uh, faith is not comprised of uh, of deeds and actions, but rather actions are just a part of God fearfulness, you know, taqwa, and uh, as he mentioned, taqwa and bir. But how you even distinguish that from Iman, I don't know. So I don't know and understand how they came up with that view because it seems clear to us that all of this is a part of Iman. It's all a part and fits under Islam, of course. And Then the Imam, after using that ayah and mentioning that ayah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that if you differ, this is better for you for the final determination. Or this is more suitable for the final determination. Letting us know that what? فَرَدُّهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Return it back to Allah, meaning the book of Allah, and the sunnah of the messenger of uh, uh, Rasul, and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It means going back to Kitab al-Sunnah. So that is the minhaj of the salaf right there. That's what makes the difference between the salaf. Like when we talk to the Dio Bundys, and they say that, they say that. But when you look at some of their practices and, and their ittiqad, especially with Iman and other things and, and the divine attributes, names and attributes of Allah, they can't go back to Allah wa Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the fahm and salaf al-salih. They can't go back to that because they make ta'wil and they make, uh, they negate. And as far as Iman, they uh, have the irja that they have with regards to Iman. And so they cannot go back to the understanding and what was meant by Allah and Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Imam Abu Ubaid then he said, "We referred the matter. Uh, we referred the matter to that which Allah sent His Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and with and revealed in His book. So we found that He made the commencement of faith to be the testimony that none has the right to be worshipped except for Allah and the and that Muhammad is His Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam remained in Mecca after his prophethood for ten years or ten odd years, calling to this testification only. And at that time, nothing else was prescribed to be part of faith. So the one who responded to this call was a believer, and it was not necessary to call him anything else but a believer. And zakat or fasting or the other regulations of the religion were not obligatory upon him. The scholars have explained this by saying that this leniency at that time was a mercy and a kindness from Allah to his servants because they had just come out of the jahiliyyah. They had just come out of the days of ignorance. They had just left kufr to iman, to Islam, and its harshness. And had he charged them with all of the obligations, then their hearts would have become averse to the re revelation and their bodies would have felt burdened. So he made the faith that was obligatory upon them at that time affirmation with the tongues only. And this is what made them to be believers during the whole of the Meccan period and ten odd months 
in the Med in Medina after the Hijrah. So here Abu Ubaid, Rahmatullah alayhi, Rahmatullah wasi, is not just giving you a history lesson or giving you just a bit of the seerah, but he's showing you, and he's mentioning this for a specific reason, he's showing us that when the message was revealed and the believers began to embrace Islam, that they weren't burdened with doing the acts of ibadah like salat and zakat were, and fasting were not prescribed for them. And so this point that he's driving home is that Iman went through stages. That in the early stages of Islam, when Islam at the advent of, of the da'wah and the call to Tawheed, it was just a call to Tawheed. It was strengthening the heart, preparing the heart, the tarbiyah. That's why the Sahaba were the best. Aside from their fadl of knowing and being the, the, the companions of the Prophet wasallam, but they had the best tarbiyah because they had the tarbiyah rabbaniyah. They had the tarbiyah which was, imp, which was instituted by their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala on the tongue and action and the limbs of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And with that being the case, it was in stages. How many ahadith do we have where they say, kunna fi jahiliyyah or uh, kunna fi ahdi islam, we, were in the, we had just left, uh, we were uh, new to Islam, and then they, you know, for example, the hadith of Abi Waqid al-Laythi. And, and other, many other ahadith which illustrate that they were learning. And they were, and, and the, the religion was revealed in stages. The Quran was revealed in stages. And so Iman had different stages as far as what it, at that time they were believers. If you made the, the shahada best, with sincerity and those other conditions, you were sincere and truthful. And you, uh, so you worship the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone? That was, that was Iman. That made you a believer, right there. And, but later, as we know and understand, that when going, after going to, making hijrah to Medina, and when uh, Salat and other duties were, were uh, legislated, then that's when Iman took another, if you will, another definition. That's when it became a part of Iman to pay zakat. It became a part of Iman to establish the prayer. It became a part of Iman to fast the holy month of Ramadan. All of those things, so it came in stages. The religion was revealed in stages. And Abu Ubaid is making the point, that because Iman was in stages, that a group of the fuqaha, and from the head of them is Imam, as it's attributed to him, Imam Abu Hanifa, and really some of the some of his students that they held the belief basically in accordance to that first stage of iman that it was you know a part of the belief in the heart and testimony of the tongue but excluding the actions of the limbs that they weren't in they weren't to be called defined as Iman, as a part of Iman, but rather Iman, those things are a part of Taqwa and, and Bitter, as we mentioned. So now we get a Tassawar, we get an understanding of, of, of why and the, and the relevance of mentioning this and why it was important uh, and who he was addressing in this treatise, who he was talking about and discussing, you know, and refuting, in essence, refuting as a belief, showing that the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is Iman is comprised of those three components, uh, 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 belief on the tongue, uh, belief in the heart, uh, statement of the tongue, and actions of the limbs. And we ask of all the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I say that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the Shaitan. Wassalamu alaikum wa sallam ala Muhammad.